Okay, so um, I'm going to start lecture two. All right, so, um, so last time we saw the Riemann zeta function, I mentioned some of its properties. We got up to uh, saying something about the Riemann hypothesis, how you would check that. So uh, I want to go back um, to, you know, before Riemann, go back to Euler. So what first made Euler famous? The young man who first became famous when he computed zeta of two. Right? So this is what Euler's, Euler's great discovery, 1734, 1735, was the famous evaluation of the sum of the reciprocal squares was pi squared over six, which had been almost a 100-year unsolved problem to find a formula for the reciprocal square sum. Um, but in fact, what he actually showed was much greater than that. Uh, he showed that the zeta function he didn't call it the zeta function. He just wrote out the formula. The zeta function at even numbers has a formula as a rational multiple of the power of pi. So zeta of 2m is the absolute value of b2m. I'll say what that is in a minute. Over 2 times 2m factorial times uh, 2 pi to the 2m. Right? So this is a rational multiple of pi to the 2m. Once I tell you what... Uh, B sub 2M is. So these are the Bernoulli numbers. Uh, B2M is the 2M Bernoulli number. And so those are famous, obscure but famous sequence of rational numbers. They show up all across mathematics. They show up in number theory, largely because of this type of a situation. Um, they show up in analysis the euler maclaurin summation formula uses Bernoulli numbers. Um, they show up in topology. Uh, the uh, factors in, well, maybe both the numerator and the denominator, but certainly the, the numerators of Bernoulli numbers are much more mysterious, and they, they show up in uh, some, some, prop, some, some results in topology, in any case. Um, and so what is the, uh, what's the Bernoulli number? What are the Bernoulli numbers? So the Bernoulli numbers are there. So they are essentially the coefficients of x over e to the x minus 1, but you have to divide by n factorial. So I guess the exponential generating function of the Bernoulli numbers is x over e to the x minus 1. So I've written out the first few terms. So b1 should be minus a half. b2 over 2 should be a 12. So b2 is a 6. Um, B3 should be 0 because there's no cubic term. In fact, as the table suggests, uh, odd index Bernoulli numbers are 0 except for the very first one, except for B1. In fact, for the evaluation of the zeta function of even numbers, B1 doesn't even matter. It's just the even index ones, let me remind you, right? It's B2m that shows up. Um, so... The value of B1 is sort of irrelevant. And in fact, for many applications, only the even index Bernoulli numbers show up such that some people only consider the even index Bernoulli numbers to be the Bernoulli numbers. So they'll call B2, B1, they'll call B4, B2, and so on. Ugh. So there are all kinds of indexing issues you have to deal with. I mean, nowadays, I think this is pretty standard, but there was a point when people would just index and focus on the, the even index Bernoulli numbers. Um, now, you notice that uh, the non, the even indexed ones, they seem to be alternating in, well, after B0, but B2 is positive, B4 is negative, B6 is positive, B8 is negative. Um, oh, I guess I, of course, lost a sign there. Um, <laughs> and so these do alternate plus or minus signs starting from, from B2. And um, the coincidence of the minus 1 over 30 is indeed a coincidence as the last, first and only time the two even index Bernoulli numbers are actually equal. And the initial values seem to suggest that they're getting small, but in fact, they actually get large. They go to infinity. You just don't see that initially. Um, so one way to see that, if you rewrite the uh, Bernoulli number zeta formula, you, if you solve this equation for B2m, you multiply by the denominator and divide by the 2 pi over 2m, then you get 2 times 2m factorial over uh, 2 pi to the 2m 
times zeta of 2m, and because we know that that's a series of 1 plus 1 and a half to the blah plus 1 third to the blah, this is actually greater than 1, and so this is at least as big as 2 times 2m factorial over 2 pi to the 2m, so as you remember from calculus, x to the n over n factorial goes to 0, so n factorial over x to the n goes to infinity. This goes to infinity with m. Okay, so despite the initial appearances, um, this is not yet bigger than 1. I, I think b14 in magnitude will be bigger than 1, um, but they will eventually get quite large. Um, so the 691, that's a prime, and essentially anywhere in math, if you ever come across the number 691, as Andre Vey called it, a tracer for the Bernoulli numbers. Um, so not that people see 691 all the time, but when I was in, a, I went to a, a subway near campus once, and the price of the sandwich, absolutely true, was $6.91. I got very excited. The uh, cashier said, would you like your receipt? He was like ready to throw. I was like, no, no, no. Let me have, unfortunately, I lost it. I really would have. <laughs> in any case, um, yeah, I, I, I know at least one very famous mathematician whose Gmail account has a 691 in it, sign of a tracer of a number theorist. Um, in any case, so, um, yeah, so the Bernoulli numbers do get big, and there's not a concrete formula for them. The denominators can be described in a relatively accessible way, but you know, any theory that's going to explain you know, a sequence of numerators, you know, 1, 1, 1, 1, 691, ooh. so just... The pattern is that they're the numerators of the uh, of the numerators. Okay. So, as an example of um, Euler's formula here, if I set m to be one, zeta of two is b two, which is a six, and then I get two times two factor. That's a four. Two to the two, I get a four, and I get uh, excuse me, m is one. I get two to the two is four. The fours cancel. I get pi squared over six. So it really does recover Euler's evaluation. And so you would find that, for example, um, you recover zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6. Zeta of 4 is uh, pi to the 4 over 90, and so on. Okay? Um, they're not all going to be pi to a power divided by something, because you know, zeta of 12 will have a, a 691 in the numerator. Okay? So, um, now, there is... Um, there's one controversy about Bernoulli numbers, which is, should the first Bernoulli number be minus a half or plus a half? Might say, well, what's the controversy? You just define it as minus a half. But if you, in the literature, there, is a kind of, there are other conventions where plus a half is better. Now, if you wanted to change that power series to change the minus a half to plus a half, what could you do? <coughs> just add x. Okay? And so... We do that. Does it teach the controversy? Should B1 be minus a half or plus a half? I think that would go over too well in the schools. Um, anyway. <laughs> minus a half or plus a half. Right? So if you wanted to uh, get the plus a half, all you would have to do is just add x. Okay? And then you would get, maybe I'll call it, I don't know, Bn twiddle, x to the n were n factorial where the first guy becomes minus a half plus one is plus a half, and everything else stays the same. Okay, so it's, it's not a really a big deal, and as I pointed out before, like for computing the zeta value at an even number, doesn't even matter, doesn't show up. Um, but I think this is pretty much the, con well, for many people, this is the convention now, minus a half. But there are compelling reasons to use plus a half, such that, um, I mean, there was a book published within the last several years on Bernoulli numbers and zeta functions, and they kind of made a point of using, uh, I think they used plus a half. <sighs> yeah. Okay. So, oh, oh, and of course, if you just do a little bit of algebra, this does, you know, you can combine the terms. This, it might not look like a, an attractive formula. It looks messier, not as simple as x over e to the x minus 1, but there are generalized Bernoulli numbers in which this expression, x e to the x over e to the x minus 1, is the expression that gets extended. So, so as I said, there really are compelling reasons to, um, to want to use this convention, but we're not going to worry too much about it. Okay, so where does Euler's formula for the uh, zeta function at even numbers actually uh, come from? So I wanted to um, mention that briefly here. 
so that you have the proof of Euler's formula, Euler's evaluation, it comes from his idea that uh, the sine function has an infinite product representation. So where does sine vanish? It vanishes at zero, plus or minus pi, plus or minus two pi, plus or minus three pi, and so on, that's it. If the integer multiples of pi, it doesn't have any other, in the, even in the complex plane, there are no other zeros of the, of the sine function. And so if you take kind of this product over the reciprocal roots, n squared pi squared, n squared pi squared there, um, then uh, you get this product representation for the sine function. And well, with polynomials, if you know the roots and you know the multiplicities, see these are simple roots, because cosine is roots like cosine at these numbers is not zero. They're simple roots, so they should each have a factor appearing once, but as an infinite product, you may say, well, but I could, you know, if it was a polynomial, it would be determined up to a non-zero constant, if you know the roots and the multiplicities. But as an infinite product, you say, well, wait a second, I could multiply that with the thing by e to the x doesn't change the nature of the roots of their multiplicity. So how do I know that the right-hand side is sine x? Maybe I need to multiply by some exponential factor. So this is true, and Euler did have to kind of convince his contemporaries who kind of objected, but how do you know that there's not some auxiliary non-vanishing factor there? But this is, so it took Euler a while to kind of <coughs> verify that this product representation is correct. I mean, you could multiply this out and um, maybe compare the you know small values or something. In any case, how does this help with the sum of the reciprocal powers? So Euler's idea was to take logarithmic derivatives. I think I mentioned logarithmic derivatives last time. Take logarithmic derivatives. So the logarithmic derivative of a function, you take your function and you replace it with 1 over f, f prime. Okay, it would be the derivative of log f if log f made sense. But even if it didn't, f prime over f still always makes sense You know, if f is not 0 at a point. And so the, the thing is that if you take the logarithmic derivative of a product, it's the sum of the logarithmic derivatives. That is just the product rule, if you clear denominators. Okay. Um, and so if you just extended this to infinitely many terms, well, if you do the logarithmic derivative of sine, you get 1 over sine over uh, the derivative of sine is cosine. I mean, or maybe I'll put this implication in quotes, infinitely terms. This should equal 1 over x, x prime, plus the sum of 1 over x squared over n squared pi squared. And the derivative of, the, of that is uh, minus 2x over n squared pi squared. And so um, what I would like to do then in this expression is I don't like the 1 over x as the leading term, so I just want to multiply by x. And so what's going to happen with this expression here is we're going to get x cosine x over sine x. And we're going to get sum n going to 1 of uh, minus 2x squared over n squared pi squared. And then we have 1 minus x squared over n squared pi squared. And so if we take out, um, and let me actually, uh, yeah. Oh, I lost the one. <coughs> Sorry about that. You also multiply by x. Oh, no, no, no. No, that's okay. If you think I made a mistake or not. I mean, so I think everything is okay now. A little bit worried there for a moment. Um, okay, so let's take one minus twice. And so what I have here is an expression over one minus itself. And... You know, r over 1 minus r, if you do the geometric series, this is the sum of r to the m for m going over 1, not going to 0. You get the geometric series starts with the r. And so if we keep this in mind, then we can get, oh, 1 minus 2, sum over n, and then sum over m, um, x squared over n squared pi squared to the m. And so if we uh, switch the order of summation, which is about like two tricks on analysis. Switch the order of summation and integrate by parts. So, or I guess, use, and use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So I guess there are three tricks. Okay, so uh, switch the order of summation. 
And then the uh, sum on the inside does not depend on m anymore. And so I can move the x and the pi term out front. And so let me take the, uh, I'm sorry, let me take the x of the 2m and the pi of the 2m outside and on the inside. There I have my zeta value. So that's zeta of 2m. Okay? So on the one hand, this series I can write, there's my power series representation, and the coefficient of x to the 2m is, is minus 2 times the zeta of 2m divided by pi to the 2m. If only there were another way to write out x cosine x over sine x, we get a formula. And there is another way to write out x cosine x over sine x. So we get x cosine x over sine x. If you recall the uh, exponential formula for cosine and the exponential formula for sine, let's do a little bit of algebra. So clean up the twos, move the i upstairs, and then I'm going to multiply top and bottom by e to the i x so that the second term and the sum and the difference both become a 1. So you get e to the 2i x plus 1 over e to the 2i x minus 1. And now I'm going to think about the numerator as e to the 2i x minus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Um, and so we're going to get 1 plus 2 over e to the 2i x minus 1. So we get i x plus 2 i x over e to the 2 i x minus 1. And that looks great because that gives us the Bernoulli numbers. Right? So we get i x plus sum over um, all n, b n over n factorial, 2 i x to the n. Okay? And so if we compare the coefficients, look at, look at that. And look at that, okay? And so at n equal 2m, you can read off minus 2 zeta of 2m over pi to the 2m. That's the coefficient from that formula, minus 2 zeta over pi. And the coefficient from this formula will be b2m over 2m factorial. And then we have a 2 to the 2m and i to the 2m will be minus 1 to the m. And so then you can, uh, you just take absolute values to get rid of the signs. You take absolute values and you solve for the zeta. And you'll recover Euler's formula. Okay? And so in this way, Euler was able to calculate uh, these values. So um, this isn't going to help us with the prime number theorem, but it's giving us the even values, and so, of course, the natural question is, what about the odd values? I was once a judge at a science fair many years ago in high school science fairs and student math projects, and student student had the natural title, zeta of 3 over pi cubed irrational. Or zeta of 3, a rational multiple of pi cubed. Um, there's no reason to expect this. In fact, if you look at the ratio, it doesn't look rational in any sense, the decimal, the continued fraction, or whatever. Um, and in fact, the belief now of zeta of 3 is probably even like algebraically independent of pi cubed. It's sort of the wrong question. We do not expect the odd zeta values to be related to the odd powers of pi in any way at all. There's no proof of that, but there's no formula for these numbers. We know that you know, zeta 3 is irrational. Other ones should be irrational, but no specific example can be pointed to. Um, and they're probably all transcendental, like the even values of the powers of pi, but they're, they're largely mysterious. Um, but at least at the even numbers, we're, we're in shape. We have an actual formula. So I want to discuss now how the Riemann zeta function extends to these Dirichlet L functions, which are in the title of the course. Are there any questions? So... <coughs> So we want to talk about L functions of Dirichlet characters. So first let me remind you what a Dirichlet character is. So a Dirichlet character is a group homomorphism. It's a multiplicative function 
if you're in this chi, from some units of Z mod M to the non-zero complex numbers, or to the unit circle. It's a finite group on the left side, so the values have to be roots of unity. So it's a multiplicative function on the um, invertible numbers mod M, and we could, if we wanted to, we could view it as a function on the integers, so just by lifting the, the argument of the function up to the integers, but uh, what do we do with the numbers that are not reduced to a unit mod M? We uh, set chi A to be zero, if uh, A and M have a factor in common, so that it wouldn't make sense to say A mod M is in the invertible numbers. And this keeps chi totally multiplicative, even as a function on, on the integers. So, um, so here are some uh, examples. Oh, so, so here, let's, the dumb example, the trivial character. Trivial character, mod M. I'll call it one bold, bold one sub m, and its value is going to be one. If a is relatively prime to m and zero, if a is not relatively prime to m, so that if the input is an invertible number mod m, it's just one. So it's just one everywhere, except where I just have to make it zero because the thing doesn't make sense as an invertible number mod m. So the simplest thing is the trivial character mod one is just identically one. But the trivial character mod 2, there will be 1 on the odd numbers and 0 on the even numbers. Okay, so uh, it, it'll be 0 periodically. Um, so let me show you a, a table of some examples of some non-trivial uh, Dirichlet characters. Here's some, here's some Dirichlet characters. Put the modulus, you should think of the input as being a number mod 4, 8, 5, 3, or 6. And so what we have here... So, for instance, mod 4, well, the even numbers has to be 0, because it doesn't make sense there. Mod 8 has to be 0. Mod 5 has to be 0, 5 and 10. Mod 3, 0 at multiples of 3. And mod 6, it's not just 0 at 6, but at 0 at 2 and 3 and 4, and 8 and 9 and 10, because these have factors in common with the modulus. But elsewhere, right, mod 4, the units mod 4 is 1 and minus 1, or 1 and 3. And so that's a group of size 2. So you can send 1 to 1 and 3 to minus 1, and you just repeat periodically. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. Mod 8, um, the invertible numbers mod 8, it's not a cyclic, it's there's 1, 3, 5, and 7, and that's a little group of like z mod 2 cross z mod 2 multiplicatively. So all I really need is the, uh, the values of 1, 3, 5, and 7, and I have to send 1 to 1, and the other is I just, I can pick any value, send it to minus 1, and, uh, and then the, that goes to minus 1, and then 7 is the product of 3 times 5, mod 8, so that has to go to 1 minus 1 minus 1 equals 1, and then I can extend periodically. 5, 2 is a generator of the invertible numbers mod 5, so 2 goes to i, 2 squared is 4, that goes to i squared is minus 1, 2 cubed is 8, so that goes to minus i, i cubed, which is the same as 3 mod 5, so that goes to minus 1. So you can get this pattern, 1 i minus i minus 1, 0, and it repeats Periodically, I can square a character, it's still a character, and then the values become 1 and minus 1. You might recognize this as a Legendre symbol mod 5. It's 1 at 1 and 4, and 2 and minus 1 at 2 and 3. And then the trivial character, non trivial character mod 2, you just have to decide where 1 and 2 go. 1 has to go to 1, 2 goes to minus 1, and you repeat periodically. And mod 6, again, two, two elements, 1 and 5, and so you just send 1 to 1 and 5 to minus 1, and that's the multiplicative, and you repeat it periodically. So we have various characters, various moduli, moduli, and these should be thought of as generalizations of the trivial character mod 1. And so as long as I have uh, a character, then what I can do is we set for a Dirichlet character chi, the L function of chi is set to be the sum where the coefficients are the character values, okay? And you can write this, because it's multi totally multiplicative, it can be written as a product over the primes. Instead of 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the s, it's 1 over 1 minus chi of p over p to the s. And this is for real part of s greater than 1, like with the Riemann zeta function. Um, there's a larger domain where the sum makes sense. We'll get to that shortly after looking at an example. But this is a generalization of the Riemann zeta function. 
if I use the trivial character mod 1, all the entries are 1, all the numerators are 1, it's the Riemann zeta function. And so we have this infinite family of cousins of the Riemann zeta function, and we would expect, it turns out that many of the things that one can do for the Riemann zeta function, you can do for these often in a very similar way. But it will turn out that these functions, when chi is not trivial, don't have a pole at 1 like the Riemann zeta function does. It's a very, very important difference. If chi is a trivial character, actually, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So the, 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 the zeta function is the L function of the trivial character mod 1. If I looked at the trivial character mod 2, what would that be? Well, it would be, it looked like the zeta function, but all the odd terms have disappeared. In terms of the Euler product, you have to avoid the prime 2. Right? There is no factor of 2. So if you want to relate this to the Riemann zeta function, then you should take the zeta function and multiply by 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s to cancel out the 2 factor in the Euler product of the Riemann zeta function. So the L function of the trivial character mod 2 is not quite the zeta function. You kind of lose. It looks, when you write it like that, it looks like you're gaining something, but you're actually losing something. Right? So you, you've removed the Euler factor at 2 in zeta by multiplying by it, not by dividing by it. So you get used to thinking in those terms. Um, so that's what the L function of a trivial character looks like. What about the L function of, let's bring down our examples here, the top of the slide. There's the character mod 4. So it's alternating odd values. 1 minus 1 over 3 to the S, plus 1 over 5 to the S, minus 1 over 7 to the S, plus 1 over 9 to the S, minus 1 over 11 to the S, and so on. So if you wrote this out as an Euler product over all primes, 1 over 1 minus chi 4p over p to the s, and the factor when p is 2, chi 4 of 2 is 0, so you could drop that if you wanted to, although it's very useful to think that the Euler factor of 2 is there, it's just the constant factor 1. In any case, um, while the coefficients in this expansion are alternating 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, Please note that chi 4 on primes, there it is up there, right? So on a prime, at 3 it's minus 1, at 5 it's 1, at 7 it's minus 1. What's the next prime? 11, it'll still be minus 1. So this is not, this is not down here, it's not alternating plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. It's more subtle than that. It's a little bit more complicated. However, however, if you look at the series representation, hey, wait a second, this actually converges For real s, that's not reals. For real s, greater than zero by the alternating series test. So the series actually converges on a wider domain than we initially expected. If you want to talk about absolute convergence, this, this thing is not going to converge absolutely if the real part of s is less than or equal to 1. But if you just take the series as it is and expand it out, we see that this converges for the real part of s, uh, for s greater than, greater than zero. So what's known about these uh, Dirichlet L functions? So some properties. So what time I go until 5 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the series representation actually converges all the way back to zero, if chi is not a trivial character, okay? And it's analytic there, holomorphic. Okay, so the half plane where it, it, it you know it's analytic um, initially is a little bit bigger than for the, uh, for the Riemann zeta function. Um, and by the Euler product, Euler 
the Euler product essentially implies that this thing is not zero for the same reason as for the Riemann zeta function, for the same real reason or for the same fake reason using an Euler product um, to the right of one, um, the whole half plane, it's not zero. Like with the Riemann zeta function, although, for, so for trivial chi, for non-trivial chi, the series already makes sense. That is meaningful on the line real particles one. This doesn't vanish on the line real particles one, like with the Riemann zeta function. And this is actually essentially equivalent to the quantitative form of Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progression. So this is, this is hard. <laughs> Okay. Even, even at the number one, it's already hard um, because the product, when I gave you the product, this product here, it's only initially obviously meaningful to the right of one. To say that, is it true at S equal one? The series makes sense, gives meaning. But is the product still equal to the series? I think, well, of course. It's like an Obel's theorem or something. That's only for series. It's not for products. There are counterexamples for products. Anyway, it is true that if you plug in one, this is legitimate. But that's actually quite hard and, and, and not actually so important. And the, the non-vanishing is not proved by using the product representation. It's more, more complicated than, than that. Okay? Um, all right. So uh, let's take a look at... Um, that, that, uh, what do I want to take a look at the value of it? Well, so we, we, right, so we know zeta at even numbers, and we don't know zeta at odd numbers. And so what about What about these, uh, these L functions? Do we know their values at certain positive integers? Can we find formulas that generalize Euler's uh, formula? And the answer is yes, we know it for half of them. Either we have a formula at the even numbers, or we have a formula at the odd numbers, and at the other numbers that, uh, the other numbers that are not even or odd. You know, anyway, at the other half of the numbers, it's a complete mystery, except it is true that at the number one, there's always a formula, but um, in kind of two different cases in any end. So what can we say about this? So it turns out to uh, describe in which case we know what's value at the evens or at the odds, it comes down to what's called the parity of the character. So what's the parity of the character? Parity. So the value of a character at minus 1 is going to be 1. And so a Dirichlet character at minus 1 is about as plus 1 or minus 1. And so what we do is we, we, we call it even or odd depending on this value. So we call a character even if the value is 1 there. And we call a character odd if the value is minus 1. Um, so for example, uh, the, uh, uh, the trivial character is always even because right, it's just always one. Um, even, or it's one or zero. Anyway, it never takes a value minus one. So, at, uh, yeah. Um, and some other examples. Uh, so let's take a look at some characters and their parity. So we have the uh, character mod four, character mod five, the square of the character mod five. So if I go back and find those tables of values, let's see what we can say about so there's the character mod 4 at the top of that page. So here, is this even or odd? So I want to know the value at minus 1 mod 4. So it's odd, right? So this is odd. Odd. And where's the character mod 5? There's the character mod 5. What's that one? Even or odd? It's odd. You look at the value minus 1 mod 5 this is 4. It's minus 1. So this is odd. And then uh, if you square, well, if you square an odd thing, it'll turn even, right? You get a minus 1 there. So this is even. Okay? So the parity is they're kind of the, every, the characters fall into two types, the even characters and the odd characters. And so in some sense, the, 
The even character should be remembered as the things that are most like the zeta function. After all, the zeta function comes from the trivial character mod one, which is even. And so the L functions, the even characters, we're going to behave more like that. We're going to find even values of even integers for those guys, and there will be formulas as odd integers for the L functions of the odd characters. So the parity kind of lines up nicely in that way. But in order to explain that, um, it turns out that to have a nice formula, there is a little bit of a problem that can arise, and we need to get around it, and this refers to the issue of primitivity. So what you might have happen is a notion of primitive characters and non-primitive or imprimitive characters. And so this is related to the following fact. So if you look at, well, so here. If D divides M, we could consider um, if a character mod M comes from modulus D. So let's see, how would that work? So if you give me a character mod M, you know, if I have numbers mod M, I can reduce them mod D. D goes into M. Like if I have numbers mod 15, I can reduce them mod 5. If you have numbers mod 15, you can't reduce them mod 12. That doesn't make sense. You can't reduce them mod 7. You can reduce them mod 3, mod 5. So if there were, so where this is the reduction operation, so if it were possible to find a character to modulus D, where D is some factor, proper factor, um, if there were a character mod D that when composed with reduction gives you your original character, chi is not really living at modulus M. It kind of comes from modulus D. And so primitive is when this doesn't happen. Okay, so we recall chi primitive If it's not, um, not from, if it's not coming from modulus D, for any, for all, proper factors. So you kind of have to investigate for different divisors whether things might be coming from a smaller modulus. So being primitive means you know it lives at that modulus and yet it doesn't come from anything lower. So for example, um, take this character mod four. Could it come from modulus two? I mean, what what are the characters mod two? Think about that. What kind of characters could there be mod two? Anybody have an idea? Huh? It's just trivial, because like, there's a one-element group. Now, chi-4 is not itself trivial. It's not identically one. So its values don't all come from something mod 2. So chi-4 is primitive. Um, look at this chi-8. If it came from a lower module, just because it's a prime power, it would have to come from modulus 4, or maybe modulus 2, but then it would come from modulus 4. Is this character consistent with this character? If you look across the values, there's a problem here, right? Look, after all, 1 and 5 are congruent mod 4, but this character at 1 and 5 doesn't take the same values. It doesn't, it can't come from modulus 4. Okay? So chi 8, that example is also primitive. Chi 8 is primitive. Um, now, here, if you look at chi 3 and chi 6, now you see, well, it, they don't look the same. But if you look at the numbers relatively prime to 6, they actually match. Okay? And so if you took numbers mod 6 that are invertible and you reduce them to modulus 3, you would, you would recover the values for chi 3. So chi 6, so chi, chi 3 is primitive. When the modulus is a prime, a non-trivial character mod of prime is, is primitive, but um, other cases you could have non-primitive characters. Okay. 
Um, so you have primitive characters, you have non-primitive characters. And if you have a non-primitive character, you can then try to talk about, well, what is the smallest modulus that it kind of comes from? And then that character that it comes from in that modulus, that will be primitive. Um, so the notion of primitivity is not some abstract concept about a homomorphism. It's a property of how all these different groups, they, the, there are natural homomorphisms between them when one modulus goes into the other. It's just all about, you know, can you, can you kind of reduce the thing coming from one of these smaller groups? So the way these groups are in, interconnected with each other um, is where the notion of primitivity comes from. If you go further on in the subject, and this is kind of maybe a, a 19th century view of you know, the notion of a primitive character, but if you go further, you learn about how to think about these things in terms of Adele's and Edel's, and the whole notion of primitivity just disappears. Um, and, uh, but but any, if you think about it in this way, we have this notion of primitivity, but later on, things are jazzed up and the concept kind of falls away. Um, in any case, so you have the notion of parity, you have the notion of primitivity. Some characters are primitive, some characters are not. Oh, what about the trivial character? When is the trivial character primitive? Only at one. Right? Every character, every trivial character comes from a lift from the trivial character mod one. Okay. So um, that's the notion of primitivity. And um, I think that's all I wanted to say about that concept. It's a little bit tricky. Um, when, you, when you first start working with these things. And then the, uh, the last thing is just going to um, introduce to you a... Are there any questions? Introduce um, for a Dirichlet character, it's Gauss sum. So these are certain exponential sums introduced by Dirichlet, uh, by, Dirichlet by Gauss. Right, so for a Dirichlet character, I'm sorry, for a Dirichlet character, chi mod m, means the modulus of it is m, um, we set the, the Gauss sum of chi to be the sum from, well, let's say 1 to m, chi a e to the 2 pi i a over m. So Gauss introduced these series when he was like in one of his proofs of quadratic reciprocity. It's some kind of discrete analog of the gamma function in some sense. Um, you might say, why are you summing up to m? Why not m minus 1? Chi then is 0. Well, not if chi is the trivial character mod 1. So um, anyway, uh, so we have this Gauss sum, and here are some facts about it. Um, first of all, if, uh, if chi is primitive, the magnitude of this, it's a sum of, I guess, phi of m numbers, right? Because if a is not relatively prime, it's actually the term is zero. So when a runs through the invertible numbers mod m, you have phi of m roots of unity there. Think of all the size is phi of m, but... Um, in fact, the, the magnitude is exactly the square root of m on the nose. Um, this is not generally true if chi is imprimitive. You could run into some problems. Um, and uh, in particular, if chi is a primitive quadratic, quadratic means the values are always plus or minus 1 or 0, um, then uh, the actual value will be explicitly, without the absolute value signs, it's generally a complex number. But if chi is quadratic, the chi is real, but you still have those roots of unity, but the value turns out to be, um, oh, oops, sorry. That turns out to be i to the delta root m, where delta is 0 if chi is even, and 1 if chi is odd. So the actual value of the Gauss sum of a quadratic primitive character is root m, in the even case, and i root m in the odd case. The i is the same i up here. Okay? Um, so, as another example, if you took the Gauss sum of the character mod phi, the thing that has values of 1 and minus 1, and i and minus i, it's not a quadratic character, um, and its value turns out to be uh, minus the square root of 5 minus root 5 over 2, plus the square root of 5 plus root, plus root 5 over 2i. Okay? So not the friendliest number in the world. Um, in any case, there it is. So kind of an explicit example. Okay. So um, I would like to find a formula for the values of an L function at 
positive integers, mimicking what Euler did for the zeta function, but he, Euler only did something at even numbers, and so for primitive characters, we will get a formula, but it will depend on the parity of chi linked up with the parity of the integers at which I try to evaluate it. Okay. And so, for a primitive character, primitive character chi, and real part of s bigger than 1, um, there's actually one that does what's called finite Fourier analysis. Um, and we can work at, so of course, strictly by definition, it's given by this formula. But it turns out, this is kind of using the primitivity, you can write it in a completely different way. That's not all. Conjugate of chi times a series e to the 2 pi i n over m over n to the s. Okay? You may think, oh, that doesn't look friendly at all. Um, so, oh, yeah, 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 right, okay. And so what I'm going to do now is kind of a trick is I'm going to have this on the outside and then I can think about this as sum over A or minus A, and A only matters here mod M and only matters here mod M. And so if I sum this with using A here and here, or if I sum this using minus A here and here, it's the same thing. And so I'm going to add those together, so I have to divide by 2. So I'm going to write chi of minus 1, g of chi over 2m, and then I'm going to have summing a mod m, chi bar a, and then I'm going to have 2 pi i n over m over n to the s, and then I'm going to have the sum a mod m chi bar of minus a times the sum e to the minus 2 pi i a n over m over n to the s. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in common. Like this, this thing here, I can write, it's multiplicative, and chi bar of minus 1 is the same as chi of minus 1. It's a real number. It's plus or minus 1. So this is chi of minus 1 chi bar of a. And so actually, I can put the terms together. And um, get summing over a mod m, chi bar of a, and then I get a big sum, it's e to the 2 pi i n over a n over m plus chi of minus 1, that's a plus or minus sign, e to the minus 2 pi i n over m over n to the s. Whoosh! And so whether this is an even character, this has become a cosine, and if this is an odd character, it's going to become a minus sign, so, and thus, thus this will become essentially a sine function. And so this will either be a cosine of 2 pi a n over m or a sine of 2 pi a n over m with some funky denominator of 2 or 2 i. And so I'm faced with trying to sum up a cosine Fourier series and a sine Fourier series. And so here's basic fact. Here's, oh, by the way, notice that the a... A here I can take running from, well, 0 to m minus 1, or perhaps. The A over m is, is some ordinary proper fraction. And so look at these formulas here. So these are Fourier series formulas with the denominator cosines with n to the 2 and n to the 4, and this, this pattern continues. And then I have sine with odd denominators, and I get some funky, the, the same power of pi, n squared, pi squared, n cubed, pi cubed, and so on. And then I get some polynomials here. Notice the constant terms. 1 6, 0, minus 1 over 30. Bernoulli numbers. Okay? And so these things here, these are called the uh, Bernoulli polynomials. And because I faced cosine, I need an even denominator, and sine, I need an odd denominator. So the way I get cosine here is if chi is even, and then I want s to be even. And the way I get a sign here is if chi is odd, and then I need s to be odd. 
And so we see that if you know the parity of chi, it's going to predict at which positive integers you're going to get a concrete formula. And we're just about out of time. And so I'll just write down the, uh, the well, right, so you can, you can get a formula. I'll leave it to you to look in the notes where I work out the gory details for primitive chi. That if, if chi is even, that L of uh, an even number and chi is some rational multiple of the even power of chi, and the chi is odd, then the L function at odd positive integers is some rational multiple of pi to the odd power, and these things involve Bernoulli numbers. The formulas are a bit of a mess to write down. Using the functional equation, the values at positive integers become values at negative integers, but they're much cleaner. Um, in any case, so we get explicit, uh, explicit values, and so I'll just give you uh, one of them. So for example, chi 4 is odd. So you can recover that uh, L1 chi 4 is pi over 4. That was Euler Leibniz's famous evaluation of 1 minus a third plus a fifth minus a seventh. And uh, L of 3 chi 4 is pi cubed over 32. Okay, But you don't get an easy formula for L of 2 chi 4, the sum of 1 minus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 5 squared minus 1 over 7 squared. That's as mysterious for this guy as the zeta function is at 3. Right? This thing at even numbers is mysterious, just like the zeta function at odd numbers is mysterious. It all depends on the uh, parity of the character. So in my notes, I go into the details of these calculations, but um, I'll stop there for today. Thanks. Thank you.